to invite Elise Crone um, from Wild Foods and Medicines and Grub to talk to us about winter tree teachings for building sustainable communities. Um, Elise Crone has an MED uh, and is the Wild Foods and Medicines Director at Grub and an educator, author, herbalist, and native food specialist. She is committed to cultivating healing relationships between people, plants, places, and cultural traditions. Elise, thank you so much for joining us. I, I'll hand it over to you. Thank you so much. It is an honor to be here. Um, and I am definitely an evergreen grad. I am joining you uh, from Olympia, from the, the lands of the Squaxin Island people, and also want to um, put a shout out of gratitude to the Nisqually, Chehalis, and Skokomish people who are so near to Olympia. Um, and I'm wondering if um, you can, oh, great, okay, excellent. And I see some familiar faces joining us um, and it's, yeah, just wonderful to be here and among the Evergreen community. Um, I am a white settler. My family is Northern European and I came here in 1998 to go to the Evergreen State College with a background in herbal medicine and worked at Radiance in downtown Olympia for seven years. And um, and when I was studying, I studied with uh, Maria Elahimo and Frederica Bocut, um, did a lot of ethnobotany and pre-med work at Evergreen and had such an incredible experience and also uh, trained as a medical assistant with Janet Partlow in the clinic there in a time where they were just bringing plant medicine into the clinic. And I got to do healing touch and work with the incredible practitioners there around plant medicine. Um, and what a formative time in my life. I knew I wanted to be an herbalist and that I love plants. And I thought I was gonna go to medical school at that point. Um, so I was doing everything on track for that. And uh, through studying ethnobotany, um, started working at Skokomish as part of a project with Maria Elahimo, building a garden around um, the Evergreen Longhouse, which I know many of you on campus are very familiar with, and, um, and also going to Skokomish and studying with Bruce Miller, SUBI, um, who was such an influential part of the Evergreen community and local tribal communities. And so I feel really lucky to have um, studied in those programs and uh, to spend a lot of time on the land in Evergreen. What uh, I still do, I still am on campus all the time. I now have a 14 year old daughter and it's our place, you know, it's our refuge. Um, and we have particular trees that we really love to visit um, and just to watch the seasons there is such a powerful thing. Um, and one of the things that I want to share is that at that time in my life, I was really um, looking for cultural heritage and came from a, I grew up uh, on the Columbia River in Vancouver, Washington. And my family doesn't have a religious orientation necessarily. Um, and we have family traditions, but not strong cultural traditions. And so being at Skokomish was a really new experience for me and something that I was so drawn to. And we were getting to be a part of many of the traditions in the community through working with Bruce. And we're, you know, being a young student, I was so excited to bring medicine to the community. Um, and we were doing a lot of community engagement and thinking about um, bringing plants into the clinic and trying to address um, some of the disparities. And in my, my mind, it's like, okay, we can do all these things. We have all these things to offer. And we were asking questions like, can, can we do this? And often not getting responses. I felt like I was trying so hard um, to share and to um, to create this program and wasn't getting responses from the community and sometimes not from Bruce. And, um, and at some point just took a big step back saying, what is happening? Like, why, why are things not moving forward? I have so much energy toward this. And um, was in a real like um, transformative place in my own personal journey of not really knowing 
where I came from and not really understanding my own cultural orientation. And I remember having dreams uh, about talking to people up in the community and that I was I was in a completely different place than they were, like talking to them and they were in a completely different place. And um, Rudy Reeser, who was the director for Center for World Indigenous Studies and is Oneida and Cowlitz uh, descendant, was one of my teachers then. And he said, at least you just like, you have to step back um, because if you don't really know who you are and where you come from, you're never gonna have a two-way conversation. You're not gonna be able to work cross-culturally. And actually, you know, you're asking questions and not getting answers and asking them over and over and over again, that is an answer. The answer is no. Um, and so I had this moment of like, oh, I have so much to learn. I have so much to learn about who I am and what I carry and how, how to meet people from different cultures and different backgrounds and different ways of thinking. Um, and really have that two-way conversation. And so I took a big step back from that project <clears throat> and had a complete reorientation in my own life around going to medical school, realized I'm trying so hard to make this happen. And it's um, it was a time where medicine was really changing. And I was going from being a clinical herbalist and having an hour and a half to work with my clients and going really in depth of like, how are people doing? What's their full health picture to um, shadowing doctors that only had 15 minutes to spend with their patients, um, which was very different than working in the clinic at Evergreen. <laughs> and so um, I had a huge change uh, in my pathway as a student and in my career and took a big step back and decided I'm, I'm a plant person. Like I'm a plant person through and through, and I love education. Um, I love teaching. I love practicing and um, decided to get my degree from Evergreen um, and go for a master's in education. And in that stepping back um, and working on my master's, I did a lot of work on who am I and what is my cultural orientation? Where do I come from? And how can I work cross-culturally in a way that is respectful and that doesn't, um, doesn't just reiterate colonization and superimposing uh, what I think is a solution on other people that are not asking for it or um, not being able to lift up the strengths that are happening in a community and recognize that and support that in a way that's needed. Um, so, and that is something I'm still learning um, and will learn for the rest of my life, just how to show up um, in a way that honors who's at the table um, where I can both listen to myself and listen to others. And so I feel like that has been a huge part of my learning in my career is how to listen, um, how to really observe and, and listen. And uh, I spent 10 years as a clinical herbalist. I got a master in education through Center for World Indigenous Studies. And once I stepped back, um, Bruce from Skokomish called and said, hey, do you wanna make medicine together? And so I started making medicine with him and then eventually teaching and traveling with him in communities and was able to spend seven years apprenticing with him and, um, and spent a lot of time listening and supporting what he was doing. And over time, uh, he got sick with diabetes and he was supporting the Squaxin Island Tribes Northwest Indian Drug and Alcohol Treatment Center. And they got a grant uh, to do a traditional plants program. And he was, you know, bringing back so many cultural traditions around weaving and arts and plant medicine. And they really, uh, they're a culturally based program and they were doing a lot around cultural arts and spiritual traditions, but not a lot at that point around food and medicine. 
And so they identified that that was one of the pieces that they really wanted to bring into that treatment program. And Bruce at that point said, I'm, I'm sick, I'm not able to do this, but Elise will do it for you. <laughs> I was terrified. I come from a, a family of addiction and I lost two family members to suicide. And so I grew up um, with a lot of addiction and, and I've had a personal journey around how to support myself um, and my family. And, uh, and so that, you know, I had some background in, but showing up at the treatment center and teaching there was terrifying. And Bruce supported me in that for the first year. And I remember the director, like I come from a background of, I love physiology. I love medicine. Um, I really like physiology is my favorite thing. And I geek out on how plants work in the body. And so when I started at the treatment center, they wanted me to teach weekly classes for the patients and to develop um, a garden and work with the patients in the garden. And I remember doing this like, lecture that I prepared really well for around the liver and detoxification and herbs to support energy and sat with 25 patients. It's a 45 day inpatient program, still thriving. And they were kind, um, but I completely lost them after 10 minutes. It was like, oh my gosh, they this is this is not what they want, what they're needing or wanting. And the director, June O'Brien, uh, who was the director there for over 20 years and is now retired, said, it had, you know, the workshops that you do have to be experiential. This knowledge lives in our body. And it's not about what we're going to get in our head. This is about how the plants are going to touch people uh, in their body, mind, and spirit connect them with their place, with culture, and build that sense of belonging. And so that is your job in the classroom, is to help people have a direct experience with the plants and to remember, you know, to remember who they are and where they came from and these rich cultural traditions that they carry. And so many of them uh, grew up with. And so I completely changed the way that I was teaching there and, um, and really learned so much from the patients. Uh, and they're mostly from the Pacific Northwest, but sometimes Alaska native and from other parts of the country. And so many of them grew up hunting, gathering, um, working with traditional knowledge, arts, culture. And, uh, and so we started bringing in, um, people from, from local tribal communities to teach workshops and figured out what are the plants that are important to them, co-design the garden based on what they, uh, what they were looking for. And that process of, of co-design where they get to have a voice, they get to do the work, they ask their family members for support with resources or knowledge to bring into that, um, was so powerful. It was a whole nother way of working. And those patients that built those gardens 10 years later would come back and say, look at what we did, you know, look at, look at what we built. Um, and so we just kept building gardens because it's not only the outcome, it's the process uh, that is so powerful. And I, I was at the treatment center for 10 years um, doing that work and still I'm working on contract there. Um, and the first year into the treatment center, Northwest Indian College, which is uh, at Lummi and has several satellite campuses throughout the Pacific Northwest, also got a grant and came and said, hey, are you interested in being involved with this? And, um, and so because of the relationships that I had developed with Bruce, I became a part of the, um, cooperative extension, the traditional plants and foods program for cooperative extension. And we worked with different um, elders and culture keepers in mostly tribes in Western Washington and did plant classes where Macaw would host. They hosted the first one 
and Teresa Parker and several other people in the community are the plant traditional foods knowledge keepers there. And so they hosted and invited people from other tribal communities and served a dinner and shared what's happening at Macaw. And then other people got to come and, and learn from that, learn from their model and share what they're doing. And we just kept uh, helping to coordinate those gatherings and then eventually started developing um, curricula and um, and hired more and more staff of indigenous educators. Um, and I was there also for 10 years um, and eventually came to Grub Garden Raised Bounty here in Olympia. And through the work we had done with many of those people at Northwest Indian College and Northwest Indian Treatment Center developed two curricula that I wanna share with you. So I wanna share some resources. Um, and I see Michael Bowman here, and I know that he's brought them into the MIT program. Um, and so I'm gonna share about just a couple of plants and those resources uh, which were co-designed and come from this incredible work from some of the elders that I've mentioned, the patients, uh, the culture keepers we worked with in these different programs. So I'll go ahead and share my screen. And I am gonna really try and leave 20 minutes at the end for um, Q&A so that we can open it up and you can ask questions. Um, so this uh, first, curriculum that I'm going to talk about is Tend, Gather, and Grow. Oops. Um, and I see that we have closed caption. Is that on my end or is that on your end? So I've got closed captions on the Zoom, but the closed captions coming through your screen, the bigger ones I think are on your end. Okay. Let's see if I can turn that off. I've actually never seen that. Um, I'm not quite sure how to turn that off. Let's see. I'm just going to stop sharing for a moment and see if I can figure it out. Maybe the, the, the presentation, it has the CC turned on. I don't know if you look at the presentation on the bottom left. Okay. Maybe. I see. Interesting. I've never seen that before. Okay. Give me one second here. All right. I'm not seeing how to turn it off. Um, so I might just go ahead and share. I'm sorry about that distraction. All right. So this is uh, Ten Gather and Grow, and um, this is a curriculum that we co-designed with this incredible group of educators. Kim Gaffey uh, started Grub about 25 years ago, and this is some of the folks that we worked with at Northwest Indian College and other educators and um, cultural experts, media experts. And we decided that we had, since we had designed several curricula for adults um, around chronic disease prevention, uh, like we have a diabetes prevention curriculum and traditional foods, at that point, there wasn't a lot for youth. And so we decided to develop Ten Gather Grow, which is K-12 and aligns with next generation science standards. And the curriculum has a plant guide with 20 plants in it. And each plant has an overview and several lessons. And then we have modules and the modules focus on different topics like cultural ecosystems, which is places that have been cared for by indigenous people like Camas Prairies or um, food forests or saltwater beaches with clam gardens. There's a lot of medicine making in the curriculum. So the herbal apothecary goes over how to make many different kinds of plant medicines and has actual like lessons that teachers can pick up. Um, wild food traditions takes you through the seasons. So spring, wild greens, summer berries, 
fall foods, uh, and there's a native infusion section that's about healthy beverages. Um, plant technologies is basketry, dyes, um, how plants lead us in developing our technologies. And then today I'm gonna to talk a little bit about trees um, from the tree communities module. And that curriculum is actually available on the native plants and foods curriculum portal. So if you just type that in, you'll see a portal and the portal, um, in order to protect this knowledge, uh, we had to figure out um, how to honor cultural property rights, how to make sure that people who are harvesting the plants are doing so respectfully because our goals are really to uphold uh, cultural traditions, to protect the traditions that are some, you know, some knowledge is, is meant to be kept within a community and to really honor what knowledge is meant to be kept private and what knowledge is appropriate to share with a broader community. Um, so our 10 Gather Grow teacher guide and this video honoring plants, places, and cultural traditions really address that. And we ask that anyone who uses the curriculum read the teacher guide and watch that video. Uh, and so we have a little, it's like 12 question test just to make sure that people have um, read and watched the video and that they acknowledge how to protect the information and it's a way to honor it. It's really a way to honor where that knowledge comes from. Um, so if you go to the Native Plants and Foods Curriculum Portal, some there's some information on the outside, but once you take the test, you're invited in and you have access to all these resources. Um, and this is the 10 Gather Grow Tree Communities, like what's in here, there's a tree walk and a couple of tree lessons, and then life cycle pages, I'll show you a botanical key, and you can actually see the whole tree communities, uh, I'll show you toward the end, but if you go on our wild.goodgrub.org website, the tree communities is available to anyone without getting into the curriculum portal, so you can easily find that. So a sister curriculum to 10 Gather Grow is Plant Teachings for Growing Social Emotional Skills. And this, I'm going to see if I can, this is very strange that I can't turn off the captions. All right, so Plant Teachings for Growing Social Emotional Skills. Uh, calls out how the plants lead us in different kinds of skills. And I'll give you a couple examples of that. Um, we're gonna talk about alder and cedar, but this curriculum was co-designed with the staff from Northwest Indian Drug and Alcohol Treatment Center and a team of mental health experts. And this came several years after 10 Gather and Grow. And, um, it has become my biggest passion because we're in a mental health crisis and these skills are so powerful in helping us to remember how to deal with stress and build healthy relationships and be fully present in our moment. So the curriculum has 22 plants and each plant has a skill associated with it. So you can see on the top right, oak, the skill is patience um, because oak roots itself really quickly, grows on prairies, the Gary Oak, um, and it puts a lot of intention into building really strong wood. Oaks grow slowly, but they grow very, very strong. And they're really thinking about that long-term, how am I going to thrive in the long-term? Um, so when we think about oak, we think about patience and how can we take a deep breath, um, think about our long-term goals and really move forward with mindfulness. So an example. Um, so the plant teachings curriculum has a book, cards, movement videos, posters, and an activity guide for educators. 
And we have just added seven posters and an early childhood education guide. And this is being used in treatment centers, domestic violence programs, schools, culture camps, outdoor school education. Um, and some schools are actually picking up the curriculum and using it as a social emotional learning curriculum. So Marshall Middle School is an example here in Olympia, very close to Evergreen. And they're studying one plant per month and all of the students get introduced to that plant and the skill that's associated with it. And they chose plants and skills that are both plants that the students will be really familiar with and um, and the associated skills that they've identified as really the priority skills for the students right now. So they do hands-on work. Those plants are represented on their campus or close by on their nature trail. Um, and they're getting it, like the whole school is getting it, but some of the teachers are really diving deeper and using Tend, Gather, Grow along with the plant teachings. So they might do additional activities around the plants. Uh, I just want to make a shout out to some of the folks on the development team here. I was just with Kia, who's an Evergreen student now in the master's program um, and is working at Northwest Indian Drug and Alcohol Treatment Center, running the plants program. Um, and June O'Brien on the top was the director at the treatment center for over 20 years. Um, and we have lots of folks on the team who are incredible. Shanoa in the top right is our movement specialist. And so we have, I think, seven videos that um, introduce the plants and introduce movement activities that support that. Like we're talking about Hawthorne and we're talking about courage. Shanoa le will lead you through a movement activity around cardiovascular health, but also thinking about how do we listen to our heart um, and support our heart. Uh, and this is a, a picture of Bruce Miller from Skokomish. And uh, if you haven't seen the teachings of the Tree People uh, movie, it's, it's beautiful and it features the life and teachings of Bruce. And in that video, he really talks about how each tree has a gift and those unique gifts help to support the whole forest community. And he would often say this, at the treatment center, you know, each of the patients was born with a gift. They have a gift. And how do we help them remember that gift and share that gift with the world? Um, and I think about that with trees, that each one of them is so different. And it really is all of those trees together that forms that vibrant community. And how can we bring that teaching into our own community in our classroom? So I'll start with Alder, the community builder. Um, this is one that we have a lot at Grub. And if you haven't been to Grub, uh, we are in West Olympia and we have a nature trail, three acre farm, medicine gardens. Please do stop by and you're gonna see a really big alder grove there. And that alder is helping to rebuild the land, uh, which a long time ago was cleared and was all blackberries. And now we've been really working on planting native plants and um, and just supporting the health of that land. And it's amazing to see how many animals have come back. Um, we have newts and owls and pileated woodpeckers and um, ducks that are in the are in the pond and um, it is a really beautiful place and we're establishing kind of a demonstration food forest, wetlands, and a micro camas prairie there. So come visit. Anybody can drop in and see Grub. Um, and you can find uh, more about what we do at goodgrub.org. But Alder is one of our central teachings. And um, Alder trees one of the things that's really unique about them is that they partner with bacteria in the soil, uh, Frankia bacteria in particular, and those bacteria are able to take uh, nitrogen from the air and fix it in the soil. So they're regenerating the soil and that alder 
gives the bacteria food and a place to live. So you can actually see the nodules on alder roots of the Frankia bacteria. It's amazing. Um, and that partnership, like that ability of the alder and the bacteria to work across their differences and find that common ground helps to establish this really um, regenerative forest. And alder comes in to places that have been devastated often by fire. You'll, it's one of the first ones often to come back in clear cuts or slides, and it really helps to reestablish the land. Uh, and the Forest Service used to consider it a trash tree and would poison the alder. Um, and now they're recognizing the importance of that natural regeneration and forest ecology. And also alder wood, is, it's great for smoking salmon, but it's good for many other things as well. It's medicine. Um, you can see on the left here, the female cones, the green cones are immature. And then once they completely mature, uh, they turn into, they look like little brown pine cones and they have these seeds inside them that's on the bottom right there. And those seeds are really great at flying in the wind. Um, and then on the left up toward the top, you'll see the cat, the green catkins, which is kind of how they're looking right now. Um, and then over the next month, they're going to start to um, develop and turn into these tassels. They almost look like caterpillars. And what you see is the red on the top right are pollen sacs. Um, those are red pollen sacs, and those are going to burst open, and then you'll get all this pollen flying in the wind. And that's going to fertilize the female, very immature cones, which are in the center of the picture on the left-hand side. So it takes a whole year for those small, um, those small female cones to develop into a woody cone. But um, alder is just absolutely amazing. And so many species thrive in alder forests. So deer and elk, uh, many types of birds um, and plants can come in once the alder grows very, very quickly. Uh, other plants can come in and are shaded and it drops green leaves on the forest floor and then insects live in those leaves. So it really is what our friend Tina Jackson from Suquamish calls the nursery tree. It helps you know, other plants and animals to thrive. I love how alder bark too. If you can see areas where the alder bark has been scraped or when an alder tree falls down, that bright, bright orange color that's used for dye. And this is actually um, pictures from Evergreen um, when we did an intertribal workshop on plant dyes. Um, so there's a drum on the top hand right side and you can just see the vibrant color from the alder. I also um, wanna talk about cedar and uh, cedar is associated with kindness and generosity. Uh, grandmother Cedar, uh, you, you hear um, so many stories about cedar in Coast Salish communities and the many, many gifts of grandmother Cedar. These baskets are from Ed Carrier at Squamish and a beautiful hat. Uh, many of them are waterproof and you'll see regalia, canoes, longhouses. Um, Here's an example of a longhouse uh, from the Skagit community. And you can see how tiny those people are in front of that massive longhouse and the canoes made out of cedar. So many gifts of grandmother cedar, including medicine. And I wanted to, um, to just point this out because now is a time, cedar is a great antimicrobial and is also immune stimulating. And so, there's a lot of cedar on the ground right now from uh, the recent storms. And if you take just a little bit of cedar um, and chop it up, maybe like a half of a cup and put it in a bowl, pour boiling water over it, and then put a towel over your head, it makes the most incredible steam. Um, so those of you who have been sick this winter and coughs are, are hanging out, cedar is one of the most powerful medicines for helping to open your lungs, increase that circulation and fight infections. Um, it's a great winter medicine. 
And I'm going to stop sharing there. And say these two trees, alder and cedar, have just been such incredible teachers for me. Um, and I often will sit and reflect with them, not just the like alder, how does it help us um, to work across differences and work with people that are different than ourselves. And that it's really that diversity of different people in our circle that helps us to be strong. Um, we just did a teacher training yesterday at Marshall Middle School around Alder. And one of the activities that we did is um, we pass out an Alder worksheet and it has what are different strengths that help build community? Like, I welcome others. I think of creative solutions to problems. Um, I'm a good listener. So we listed about 30 different skills that help to build a strong community and students get to identify what is one of their strengths that they bring to the community and share with a partner around that and then they introduce each other and their different strengths all in a circle so you get to hear each of the students and what some of their strengths are um, and that's a way to both acknowledge like what do we bring what you know what's important to us to build community and how can we witness others in our community and really work with each other. Um, so yeah, Alder, I'm thinking about that teaching a lot. And also as um, a lot of colds are going around, Alder buds, the little leaf buds right now are really resinous and I pick those and I, I put them in my mouth and I'll suck on them. And they're a great antibacterial. So it's almost like an antibacterial lozenge. And I really enjoy the flavor of them. Um, and uh, yeah, it's fighting infections. And when we drink alder tea, that helps the bacteria in our gut. It normalizes the bacteria in our gut and helps to build a strong gut, gut flora, a strong community in our gut, which can impact everything, including our mental health. So each of the trees there's this kind of so many layers of how they lead us, um, the teachings that they carry, which can touch us in our body, mind, and spirit. Um, and so as a educator and someone who focuses a lot on mental health, when I'm talking about the plants, I want to give the whole perspective of a plant. Um, so when we're talking about alder, what, um, who is Alder in a forest community? Who is, who uh, is the Alder supporting and being supported by? What are all those complex relationships? What is the chemistry and medicine of Alder? Um, the life cycle. And, um, and I think that really opening our sense of curiosity and wonder and getting to know the plants from that 360 degree angle of like all the different ways to know a plant. Uh, eventually it's like that, that plant is with you. Um, so for me, it's like, I would rather know five plants really well and have that in-depth relationship than to know 200 plants a little bit, just like I'd rather have five really good friends than a bunch of colleagues. Um, and so for me, it's, I just want to say plants have touched me so deeply. I still feel like a baby, like there's so much to learn. Um, and we have learned so much and we really want to share these resources because we've seen how they can touch people in a lot of different ways. Um, so Native Plants and Foods Curriculum Portal, uh, wild.goodgrub.org. Uh, those are two places that you can find the resources and check them out and learn more. And I think I'll leave, leave it at that and leave some time for questions. Awesome. Thank you so much, Ali.